he's not going to be recording. He's going to be made. Oh, well. Okay, I got to check the audio. All right, and we are live, ladies and gentlemen. And we were ready to go a couple of minutes ago, and Brad froze and disappeared. So hopefully he'll be rejoining us here in a couple of minutes. Maybe sooner. He's probably going to be mad that we started without him. But Randall told me. I'm, I'm going to blame it all on Randall. He was like, just go live. We don't need that guy. We, we <laughs> speak of the matter lightly, <laughs> uh, but do we really want to risk the possibility of the wrath of Brad? Well, no. That's that's why we talk about him when he's not around. Right. Well, I just people should know that by going live, we are taking a risk. On our <laughs> that's <end>. true. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so we, I, I just what, want to I want to say to the chats, thanks to everybody who's joined us for all these lives. We Kyle and I will be monitoring the chats for uh, for super chats, for questions, comments. Uh, we try to get to the, to all of them that we can. Obviously, we can't get to all of them in every show, and we really appreciate all the support. Uh, I say I already see a few rolling in here. Thank you, guys. We will second that emotion. So yeah, we weren't, like I said, Brett, we're still waiting on Brad here, but I do have some questions from last week or a couple of weeks ago that we could tackle maybe. Yeah, what you got? Uh, and we already have some comments. Did you see one come through, Kyle? Was there one there? What's that? A comment. Did you see a super chat come in? Yeah. I yeah. don't have it pulled it's, up. Um... We starting with that. It's uh, from Osiris. Ah, eleven dollars Canadian. Hey Randall, we loved your sacred geometry course. What are your thoughts on Manley Hall and Rudolf Steiner? There you go. Are you familiar with Rudolf uh, Goethanum? Uh, I don't know what that is. Mm. Thanks. Goethanum, buddy. Gitinum. Yes, I am. There's two of them. The first one got burned down, probably by the Nazis. The second one. Uh, Recording then- stopped. Hmm. What happened? I don't know. We're still live. That was. Yeah, oh, are we still live? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, don't worry about it. <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, I'm very familiar with Rudolf Steiner. I'm familiar with. I've read. It's been many years, but I read three or four of his books, studied his books, and then, you know, I was involved with the Waldorf School for about fifteen years. You know, because I would get the overflow from Waldorf which was the the Steiner system of education. And I would organize these classes for mostly for kids that had uh, come out of the Waldorf after eighth grade, because uh, when I was doing this in the 90s, Waldorf and Atlanta area did not go past eighth grade. So uh, it does now. They, there, there's now a Waldorf-based high school. But yeah, that was his system of education. So uh, I became very familiar with that. And uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and who is the other one? Manly Palmer Hall, Manly P. Hall? Oh, yes. I've yes. been recommending The Secret Teachings of All Ages as a really great book to start with to get the big picture, the big overview, plus a lot of juicy details about the various esoteric traditions and symbolical traditions. Um, that is a jam-packed book. But his other works are interesting as well. And I'm not quite as familiar with some of his stuff about probably read some of his smaller works, but the uh, secret teachings of all ages, that's the gem. That's the one that I, if you can get through that, that, that if you could actually read that from cover to cover, that would be kind of a monumental undertaking. And you would come away with that with a pretty good knowledge of the whole um, arcane esoteric mystery tradition um, in all of its many flavors and branches as it's come down to us. Highly recommended. All right. Yeah, I I still haven't managed to completely read Secret Teachings. <laughs> I've read most of it, and then I read parts of it in bits, but I've never sat down mm-hmm. and like read the whole thing. Well, but, neither you know. have I. Oh, okay. But I'm sure I have read the whole thing. Yeah. And parts of it multiple times. Right. Yeah. Uh, Daryl Roberts, 10 bucks, says, Big fan, thanks to all of you. Thank you, Daryl. Is that that's I think that's my old friend Daryl Roberts. We used to work together, Ah. unless it's another Daryl Roberts, but I bet it's Daryl that uh, I used to work with. And this had to have been, gosh darn, 
25, 30 years ago. Hmm. If that's, if that's you, Daryl, the, the same Daryl, I, it's good to hear from you, man. Hope all is well with you. And, uh, we should try to connect sometime while we're both still here breathing and above ground, which hopefully is going to be for another at minimum of 50 years. <laughs> Sandhill Quest, two bucks, says, uh, you guys coming to the Badlands ever? Hit me up. Oh, Badlands. Yeah, that's great. You know, we... Um, There's Brad. Let's see. The year that Bradley and I um, guided Graham Hancock and Santa... 2014. Uh, ...across the Northwest to the Midwest, we made a route through the Badlands, and it reminded me of how much I like the Badlands. Mm. It's really a phenomenal place um but we would need to come up with something well well let's see we did while we were right there we have hot springs mammoth site which is very much worth a visit that's the um the entombment of many mammoths uh just below the black hills now have you you Russ or kyle have you the one you guys ever been in the black hills don't think so Okay. If I was there, somebody dragged me there while I was unconscious. <laughs> mm. Did you guys start the show? Yeah, show is started. Are we are live, we are Brad. Live, yeah. Welcome. <laughs> but it's okay. We covered for you. <laughs> well, we got to record. I gave you Recording permission. Recording in progress. Yeah. Sorry. Had to take host back from you when you vanished. <clears throat> it's it's okay, Brad. We had some humor at your expense. Just so you know. Well, that's the least I expect. Yeah, I got a little adapter that, because uh, this laptop is Wi-Fi only, or you got to have an adapter that goes into the, you know, the C port. So I, th I think my adapter's getting a little funky and it shut down. Uh, okay. You well, guys you're are here committed now. to 930. All right. Yeah, well, hello Super chat's there. rolling in like yeah. crazy, dude. Yep. Well, let's. Forge ahead. Okay. Let's see. So, Jim. yeah, Badlands. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, Badlands, yes. I could see putting together a trip that would include the Badlands, the Black Hills, Hot Springs Mammoth site, and, oh, I don't know. I, we'd have to do a little research to make it, a, say, a four- or five-day tour worthwhile, but maybe some exploration of the underfit missouri river which was interesting i don't know we just have to do some study but i bet you bradley and i could come up with a tour that would include the badlands i was talking to scott walter the other day about uh co-hosting a tour with him up in the minnesota area if you i don't know how many listeners know who scott walter is you guys know russ and kyle who he is don't you yes, of course sir. you do yeah well you know he's we have three things in common scott and i uh we are both members of the fraternity we're both from Minnesota, and we both love geology. And in fact, he is a professional geologist. But, you know, he's written works on the Kensington runestone and the connections, perhaps, with the Templars. Really interesting stuff. Anyways, we had a very interesting conversation. We knew about a lot of the same places, um, but he was really excited about the idea. He uh, So we talked about, you know, along the... Um, along the Mississippi River there, along where the, the great bluffs are. Uh, we talked about um, the um, St. Croix River and the potholes. We talked about the North Shore. We talked about uh, perhaps doing a day of canoeing in the Boundary Waters area. Um, a bunch of other things. Talked about the Driftless area, which he was you know familiar, very familiar with. And some of the things that Bradley and I saw when we were going through there, when we were coming back from, I uh, believe it was one of the uh, Masonic gatherings up there along the St. Croix. Is that when we stopped there at, um, went through the the lake bed of Glacial Lake, Wisconsin? Yeah, that's right. And we climbed one of those, what, 400 foot high islands? Yeah, 300, something like 300, that. Yeah. 300, yeah. yeah. So that could be included. I don't know if you, know, you could get as far south to do Starved Rock State Park in the same trip that you did the North Shore of Superior, maybe. But 
Yeah, so we might very well be working out. We, we're So we're talking about that now. And, of course, we're still thinking um, Bonneville, great Bonneville flood tour, starting um, in Utah and working our way up through Idaho and probably. Yeah, that would be great. Capping it off with a boat trip up Hell's Canyon. Oh. And that would be. Yeah, I'm going to be, be awesome. checking some more sites out. Uh after our Duck Creek adventure in uh, mid April, uh huh. So between that that weekend mm-hmm. and then the Scablands trip coming up, so yeah, we still got some spaces left in the Scablands tour for May fifteenth to twentieth. So that'd be an excellent <laughs> one to jump into to introduce yourself to these mega flood stories. If you hadn't been out with us yet, that's uh, uh, right in ground zero, pretty much. Pretty much did um, did you get the uh? The communication from um, Sherry, I did. the owner, and uh, their, the lodge that we're, the resort that we're staying at there at Soap Lake when we do our trips up there has gone through some upgrades, apparently. Um, I think they've got, what, they've increased the number of saunas? Is that what they did? Was yeah, one they, of the things? they put in a spa area, look like. A spa. And uh, uh, I think that might be in the front of the uh, the old motel hotel area uh, uh-huh, where there's okay. just kind of a, a continental breakfast eating space i think that got transformed and then looked like the old game room that they had that was you know pretty outdated uh pool table and ping pong table got a bunch of uh you know exercise slash workout equipment in it so yeah it looked like uh some some major upgrades there for their amenities mm. so we would have these um what these spas or saunas or what were they were they more saunas? What? What? Yeah, I just got a quick look at the picture. Yeah, probably that's what same I did. Thing, I was... Probably the same thing you did. Yeah, it looked like some pretty high tech, advanced stuff, though. So I'm curious to try them out. But yeah, we get uh, some long driving and hiking days. Uh, there'll probably be a line to get into those relaxing machines. Yeah, I bet that'll be nice. A nice yeah. addition to the to the trips. But yeah, that's just an outstanding place where we stay. It's a a, a group of cabins. There's a Part of it, the complex is a historic hotel, and it's right on the south of, end of Soap Lake. Soap Lake, right at the epicenter there, we use it as a base to explore out in every direction to the extraordinary landscapes of the Channel Scabland. Yeah, so just, uh, you know, you can go to Randall Carlson, and there's a little uh, hamburger menu, I guess, that'll flip down. You can go to tours and events, or just type in randallcarlson.com slash tours and events see what randall's up to upcoming things in sedona and uh the one here cosmic summit 23 in Asheville, where i am in june and uh we also doing a, a montana tour in september so yeah tours and events coming up for 2023 yeah we've got i guess the next event um would be the Cumberland tour, which we don't even need to talk about because that's sold out. We got no more room and can't can't take on any more between now and departure time. But that will be followed by the conference in Arizona, just not quite. It's south of Sedona, um, it's kind of between Sedona and Phoenix. It's a so we're going to be doing a weekend conference, and that's going to be very very interesting stuff. Um, going to be very close to easter so we're going to kind of have a, a holy grail theme that's what um you know scott walter will be there and see dan rogers and a bunch of people um going to be making some very interesting presentations so i think is, is uh dave matheson in on that one also no i don't no. dave's not in on that one okay Oh no, he's he's at Utah. I'm sorry. Yeah, he's he's doing one I just saw uh, later in the year out in uh, Southern California. That's right. Sorry. For people who don't know, Dave Matheson is uh, has studied deeply into astro mythology, and he does outdoor. He does both, um, <clears throat> you know, digital um, presentations that complement his outdoor under the stars presentations that are really great. So. I'm wondering now, is he going to be at the Scablands trip in May? Because if he is, boy, that's going to add a nice dimension. I no, don't I th- think so, yeah. Sorry, Russ. No, I think it's, we got Brandon Powell again. 
Okay. Do some uh do some cold plunge ice baths and uh some of the morning breathing sessions. Okay. The Wim Hof method, variety of uh different things he he as a master trainer of. Okay. So what else you got there, boys? We got plenty of super chats rolling in. Uh Jim Howard is uh five pounds, says, uh, has anyone done a worldwide map of the world, including coastlines with the lower water levels from before the younger dryas? He says that he's seen some small ones. Yeah, what was his name? Jim Howard. Jim Howard. Yeah, Jim, that's something that I've been fantas fantasizing about for years. And it's something that really needs to be done. I, the, the one that I've got that we could actually pull up here is um, showing yeah. the map at, at three minus 350. But we know yeah. that the late, late, late glacial maximum, there may have, it may have been as low as 450 feet. You know, generally the, the number that's used is 400 feet. And as we get towards the end of the, the, the glacial period, 400 feet, it seems to have been the, the final, uh, level that it reached before really it began to go through undergo this accelerated melting but if the studies showing that it was 450 feet are uh are legitimate and they probably are because you know it, it you're when you get that deep it's it's not easy to find the traces that you would of an existing shoreline that say may have been 18 or 20,000 years ago especially when you realize that you're not only looking at you know, it's not like you're looking at a paleo shoreline that's going to be the same level all around the earth. It's going to be, have been all kinds of vertical movements. So, and then if the period during which, obviously, the longer you have a, a, a particular climate regime that's locked in, given, let's say, a certain amount of ice on the land, a certain sea level drop. So the longer that the sea level is at that at that level, um, the, the more prominent will be the shoreline that it leaves behind. Does that make sense? So if it goes down and then let's say you've got a rapid expansion of the ice for whatever reason, because the climate cools very fast, then you're going to have a rapid lowering of sea level. And then if the climate reverses itself very shortly after that, and then the, the glaciers began to melt, then sea level is going to rise up again. So obviously, if you have a stable shoreline that's, you know, 5,000, three or four or 5,000 years in extent, it's going to leave a much more easily discernible paleo shoreline than one that was, say, only a few centuries or 500 years. It makes, makes sense, right? So th that's the problem when you get into discussing 450 feet because there there is circumstantial evidence and there is evidence that it looks like it could have gone down as much as 450 feet but the 400 foot number is is very well established so what i'm getting at with all of this is that it would be very cool to see a map of what sea level would look like what the coastline of the continents would look like at minus 450 feet yeah but I could actually pull up. Yeah, go the, ahead and pull uh, it up. I, some people in the chat were asking to see what you've got. Okay, let's and do we it. we do have plenty well, of that, more, that plenty map more questions. That map we found comments. years ago. Um, yeah, just do a basic search here, and actually Geocosmic Rex comes up. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's from uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and it's uh, with sea level uh, lowered 110 meters. So that would be the key. Yep. Yeah. Um, which Randall's saying 350 feet is pretty close there. So it's, it's actually 110 meters. It's how it's labeled. So, uh, okay. I just did a basic search and, uh, yeah, not seeing it right off. Uh, but okay, yeah, we've, so the, we've got it. It's pretty well buried though. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's the main one uh, I've found looking for it over the years. You're seeing this, right? Yes. Okay, great. So this is, this is the current shorelines. And what I would call people's attention to is the, the coastal shelves, because with the sea level dropping, which we call a regression, you have a migration seaward of the coastline. When we have a transgression, which is a rising of sea level, then the sea, the coastline, the the the, the uh, it moves landward, obviously. So you've got two things to think about here. You've got the vertical rise and fall of the level of the sea, 
which then coincides with the lateral movement, the, the landward or the seaward movement of the coastline, which which is happening simultaneously. So uh, you can picture from this that as sea levels are dropping, they're exposing greater um, uh, extent uh, ranges of the of the coastline. I mean, of the cost continental shelf. Let's go here. That's not one direction I was going to go. So here we can see, I'm going to toggle back and forth. So you can see the change. And in some places, they're they're more dramatic than others. Um, I've got some of the maps here that kind of hone in on this, but I'm going to toggle back and forth. You know, you'll see, look at, look at Canada and, and its connection to Greenland up here compared to, whoops, compared to now. Look at the area up here, like by the Barents Sea and around um, the Scandinavian Peninsula and the British Islands. Um, yeah, look down here in, in Indonesia. What happens when you drop sea level 360 feet? Let's take a closer look. North America. This is this is quite interesting because I remember when first time I heard about the Bering Land Bridge and I was looking at maps. I thought, now this is way long time ago. This is, I'm probably still in high school or something. And I'm looking at maps and I'm seeing the uh, the peninsula coming off of Africa here and uh, this coming off of Siberia here. And I thought that was the land bridge. So I was picturing something relatively narrow. But r in reality, this is the land bridge you see there. It's... It's a massive, wide piece of land, hundreds of miles across. I'm going to toggle back and forth so you can see the difference, what a 360-foot sea level drop would You've do. You've got in a terms. map of that in the uh, uh, latest episode of Cosmographia number 93, where you're talking mm -hmm. about the uh, uh, John John Reeves find out there and uh, some of the papers with uh, – Frank Hibben and mm -hmm. uh, what it was it Otto Geitz Otto Geitz uh, out there um, using the monitors to blast away the the muck deposits up uh, here in the yeah, valleys. There, yeah, there was a there was a map that we used or they used for the uh, the the whole breadth of the the Bering Land Bridge out there, which was really a, a, a whole continent basically. If you look, that's really wide up there. Yeah, and it. I mean, here we have a really you know, an interesting analog um, to, you know, here's a huge landmass that was occupied by millions of megafauna, undoubtedly human beings as well, and it is now under the ocean. I'm surprised nobody's proposed that this is Atlantis yet. Take a look down here at Florida. When I look at Florida as I toggle Someone back Someone probably forth. has, Randall. Probably. Yeah. So look what happens to the Gulf of Mexico. It shrinks enormously while the peninsula of Florida looks like it more than doubles in width. Mm. And uh, up here in this area where it's now islands and all, look at this. Look at the connection between North America and Greenland. And this area here becomes just more like a fjord. But but this is just purely based on the um what is it? Eustatic change? What about ice yes. isostatic yeah, water, change? Water column change, yeah. That would be a result of some of this, right? I mean I I'm that's not I don't think that's factored in. To this. Yeah, this is this would be Taking the present, yeah. Are you talking about isostatic change? Yeah, they're not factoring the land that masses? in, right? I mean, you. I mean, how could no. they? No, no, that would not. Right. I'm, I'd be almost certain that that's not included in here. I mean, that would be a monumental undertaking, right? And it probably wouldn't be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally but you know what? <clears throat> but we ha you have to keep in mind yeah. that 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 is a factor, mm -hmm. right? So it may not really look just like this. <laughs> Well, no, it may not have looked exactly. And, of course, you know, when the sea level was at this depth, all of this was ice up here. You wouldn't have <clears throat> you wouldn't have seen any of Canada. And then the ice would have extended with fingers out into these Alaskan mountain ranges. And then, curiously, <clears throat> Beringi and Siberia were not glaciated. Hmm. 
And you can see most of it pretty much mm-hmm. follows the continental shelves. Uh, yes. And, and like Randall saying, it, it could have been <clears> another <throat> 100 feet lower. Right. So this is, this is like a minimum of the mm-hmm. extent of the lands. And here's a closer up view of Australia and Indonesia. And Graham has talked, Graham Hancock has talked about what may have gone on here during the Ice Age because there was a whole landmass that was apparently occupied uh, and perhaps even fairly densely during the Ice Age. You can see, look here, what are <clears throat> the islands now? And of course, it would have been much easier to migrate to Australia at this sea level or even lower than it would have been, say, post-Ice Age. And this is, this is pretty, the next one is pretty remarkable. When we look at the British Isles, the European continental mainland, the Fennoscandian Peninsula here, which is Sweden, Norway, uh, Finland over here, and the Barents Sea up here. Now watch what happens when we drop sea level 360 feet. We also got a lot more comments to go through, Randall. Wow. Yeah, that you is. Know, this, this is interesting. This is important and interesting stuff it that is. people should know. So yeah. anybody who's watching this, you this is good Dogger stuff land to know. there, too, and uh, how the yeah. uh, English Channel disappears, which yeah. is now Dogger huge land. channels like uh, the Scabland, Coolies. We should... We should have a, a discussion in one of our episodes about Doggerland because that yeah. seems to be a very interesting thing that was happening there between, um, you know, during the Ice Age and after the Ice Age and how it was basically inundated and drowned out in stages. But, yeah, so this this hopefully satisfies the question. And this is what we've got here with regards to... Um, I'll, I'll search out that map uh and and put a link in the description. Might not not find it right away because I I know it's buried. I've found it before, but I've I've got multiple copies of it. But yeah, it's still online somewhere. All right, I'll what else we got? Out. Okay, uh, Danny Wilson gave eight dollars. No comment there. But Todd, thank you, Danny. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Todd gave twenty bucks. Says I appreciate the deep thoughts. Keep pushing on the alternative energy. I want one of the generators when they are available. We are pushing on that. Things are happening. And I was going to actually address that. A couple of texts I got earlier, people making comments, wondering, of course, what the deal is. And uh, I'll find and pull one of those up, and we can actually address that at some point before we conclude tonight. But, yes, um, there will be information forthcoming. It won't so much at this point, at this stage, be a generator itself. What it'll be is a retrofit of a generator where you might get uh, perhaps a many-fold increase in the efficiency. A lot of generators run on kerosene. So one of the tests that is going to be underway with probably within the next month or two will be on kerosene run generators. And what, what we've seen so far is an enormous increase in efficiency, like hundreds of percent. So we'll we'll be reporting on it. And we'll have some videos and online stuff for people to look at. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, Baby Blue Sky gives five pounds, says, first of these I'm seeing live, what a joy. Fascinated with the sacred numbers, the resonance, engines, and sunk civilizations. Keep going, Carlson and Co. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and good, good. These, you know, these are the subjects, among others, that we address uh, on a regular basis. We're all interested here at Cosmography in very similar things. Um, all have a passion and a curiosity to know about the unknown things of our world and our past and. And um, not afraid to ask questions. There we go. Not afraid to ask challenge, questions. Challenge the authority and the status there we quo. Go. That's right. And uh, they need to be challenged. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, good for good for him uh, staying up. It's probably, what, 3 or 4 a.m. in the U.K. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, glad to, glad to have you with us here. Okay, uh, John Lopez, five bucks. Thank you, John. Uh, says, 
has Randall Carlson considered the possibility that the great sand dunes in Colorado were formed by a younger Dryas flood? There is erosion on the south side. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because <clears throat> clearly sand deposits in for most uh, cases are the result of uh, water work. I mean, what water does is particularly with, um, you know, sandstone rocks is it'll take it and bust it up into ever finer pieces. And ultimately you get sand. You know, if you have the, the, the pounding surf of the, of the uh, shorelines over long periods of time, will bust up rocks and make sand. There was a place that Bradley and I went to, um, we were exploring in Southern Idaho. We went to the Bruno river gorge and at the mouth of this gorge, there is huge sand deposits, uh, sand dunes, almost on the scale of great sand dunes um, in Colorado. And that was clearly the end product of water flow. In other words, you had oh, yeah. massive water flows coming through the Bruno, Bruno Canyon. And um, at the mouth, when as the water began, it, it rolled and tumbled and completely demolished any rocks that it was stripping out of the bedrock so that by the time the water um, disgorged from the canyon mouth and spread out and slowed down it was just just sand um so yeah that's the pretty much the end product uh let me see here i think those might be correct me if you remember randall like the highest sand dunes in in north america or america at least they're like 400 feet high the Bruno Dunes. Bruno Dunes, yeah. Yeah, they were very, I mean, they were huge. They Just, were. Uh, where the outlet, uh, Bruno River, and Bruno River Canyon uh, joins in with the Snake River there in southwest uh, Idaho. Yeah, I'm going to gonna pull up some maps here just because I bet you we'll get more questions with where looking at maps might be a very handy thing. Um, but let's. Look at the next question, and we can circle back to this. All right. Matt Gannon, $13, says, Randall, do you have a catalog of your library anywhere? Making a Google Sheet of your library sounds like a great weekend project for the Snake Boys. Hey, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great idea. Can you guys fly up here while we're off on the... Uh... Oh, you're going to, can you cancel your turkey trip? Yeah, well, we can cancel the turkey trip. I agree. It's a good weekend project. Me and Brad <laughs> will drink beers and Russ and Randall <laughs> will catalog the library. <laughs> All right, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know I what? Mean, our, our You know, it would end up, Randall and I would end up just looking at one book. He would be <laughs> yeah. like, you know what's in this book? And we'd open it and then that would be the whole weekend. We'd be just looking yeah, at this one be, book. Yeah. The only people that would have actually gotten things done is me and Brad. Right. They would have That's drank right. a bunch. They would have cataloged all the beers That's right. while Randall and I read one book. Yeah. An entire library of beers. <laughs> we could do our first uh, beer sampling podcast then. <laughs> We, it's a good suggestion, though, and that would be cool. Well, I, I let me say this. A, a, our, a list of our all the books. friend and colleague, young Stephen, uh -huh. uh, who's going to be helping along on this the, this final Cumberland tour we're about to do, partake of in a week, um, he has actually volunteered, said he would like to do that. But I don't know when he's going to have time. But, yeah, I, I would love to do that. Um get them all cataloged and listed and that's going to happen. I, I, I think it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen this weekend. That's for sure. Um, yeah. Well, they're weekend. a lot more, uh, organized and sorted and, uh, categorized than they were. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Way more so. Um, before, uh, before that studio behind you got built, um, Yep, there was just bookshelves full, and now there is a sense of sense of sorting to them. First, first stage. Mm -hmm. They need to go through the next stage. So yeah, that'd be great if Stephen could take that on. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna if we don't find too many other things for him to do here. Um, yeah, I found the Bruno River. This is a okay. Yeah, yeah I'm looking know. for sand dunes images. I was there about a year and a half ago. Okay, uh, GEC812 gave uh, 11, 11 Australian, I think, 
And it says, thank guys. thanks, guys, for your great work. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And your <clears throat> your donations help keep us keeping us do, doing this and um, getting more and more information together and getting yes. it out there. And um, the I list of stuff to... to see in Australia is just getting longer and longer every day, I think. Yeah. Travis oh, from man. Wisconsin, $46.02, says ancient sites in Peru. Were the precision stones melted into shape or poured into shape? I take that idea seriously. Yeah. I don't know the answer, but, um, yeah, I mean, um, Hmm. I think that that's a possibility. You know, I've worked a lot with concrete and, you know, pouring concrete, um, it's quite a plastic medium that will take on all kinds of shapes. Now, clearly if this is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Russ or Brad, uh, polymer. A geopolymer. It's a geopolymer. Geopolymer. Yeah. Geopolymer. It's a geopolymer. geopolymer. I think it's at a next level up from the concrete that I've done. But, but you know, I've thought about that. You know, we, we do a lot of concrete work and pouring. You know, you build forms and you pour the concrete. The concrete takes the shape of the form. And in a lot of the schemes for various things, like hempcrete, for example, you use hemp, but you use concrete and cement as a binder. But you can create shapes, you know. You now compared to what we're looking at at the stonework in Peru, these shapes are primitive. But still, nonetheless, you can create shapes. You can create shape blocks. You can then assemble those blocks. So, yeah, I I am totally um, comfortable with the idea that they're geopolymers that have been cast. Now, the que- if that's the case, now, are they cast and then fit together, or are they cast in place? Well, and what do you think about the, because uh, there's there's <clears throat> there's stones that look like, uh, you know, limestones or, or sedimentary rock, right? Mm-hmm. And that's a lot easier to believe as a geopolymer than, say, granite. Oh, yeah. Stuff, right? But do I you think, think that, so. Do you think that maybe igneous stones could possibly have been poured somehow? Because this is a question I see all the time. Yeah. Well, that would be more difficult to imagine, and I presume more complicated than using a carbonate-based stone, like limestone. You know, if you if you crushed up yeah, um, limestone and uh, well into a plastic medium that you could then cast in a mold, um, it would come out looking very, very much like natural limestone rock. Right, but it wouldn't have big macro fossils in it presumably so that would not be a, yeah that would be a telltale sign that it probably wasn't a geopolymer if you were seeing big fossils in there you well might, maybe you throw them in there big. to trick people yeah you could just throw a bunch of shells in it to make it really look convincing <laughs> to, to trick people <laughs> you're saying <laughs> that's what he said i did <laughs> uh okay i uh, i've got um I got the the Bruno River here. We're going to circle back for a minute to this. Uh, so we'll do a share screen. And let's see, two. There we go. <clears throat> All right. So here we got Google Maps. And you can see what we've got here. We've we, got these. We, let's see what mountain We're not looking at Google Maps here. Yeah, we're looking at uh, uh, a slide, Pleistocene glaciation slide. Yeah. Oh, how did that happen? Okay, so... Um, we should be able to correct that. Let's see here. Let's go back and stop the share and do it again. Share screen. Screen. Are we seeing Google Maps now? Yes. Yes. Yep. Ah, good. Okay. So, yeah, so we're looking at, uh, let's see, I'm, what is this mountain range here? I don't know the name of it. We haven't done much exploring in this area of no, northern you're down Nevada. In, yeah, Nevada there. <laughs> but it is the, um, you can see right here, coming off of these mountains is the Bruno, here's the Bruno River, and then this is the, oh, oh, what is it, the O, oh, I don't, no, that's the Bruno River. So here's the Bruno River coming here, and it's cut a very deep, 
Shearwald Canyon. And this is the, okay, uh, the Jarbridge River. Okay, so they meet, and then the canyon gets even deeper. And if we go up here, following it, here we go. Here is the Bruno Dunes State Park. And I'm going to jump to Google Earth. And... Let's close that down. So there's Bruno Dunes. All of this in here is the sand dunes. If we zoom in, you can see the Slow sand down. dunes take here. It, take it easy on the zoom in a bit, Randall. Slow well, I was just a in a bit. hurry to get to this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, here you can see the dunes. Let's see if I can switch over to... There we go. Put a little tilt on it. Whoops. Well. Well, back I out forgot. into space. Okay. Shot out into space. So there's there's Ooh. the Bruno Dunes. Brad, you have any pictures there of the Bruno Dunes? Did you say you were going to pull up? I can no, get I was something. looking for uh, Great Sand Dunes in uh, Colorado there at the uh, San, San Luis Valley. Here we go. Yep. Yeah, these are some, yeah, I think like you said, some of these are up to 400 feet high. So this is the end product of the erosion of the Bruno Canyon. So you clearly had the water carrying the finer sediment and super loaded, supercharged with the sediment. And in this area here, it sort of slowed down. This must have been similar, what you could almost think of as a settling pond in this area here. Um, if I shut this down, go back to Google Earth, it's this area right in here where the, where the sand was entrapped. And if we go back, you can see here's the discharge pathway would have been coming right up here this way or this way. But... <clears throat> Looks like what you would have had was a lot of water settling out in this area here and dumping its sand deposit. And probably this was a, a lake in here. <clears throat> I'm guessing. And let's see. So the uh, Snake River is here, right here. So that's where all this is ultimately heading is for the snake, towards the Snake River. So, yeah, all of this here where it's green, that would have been submerged during the flooding. And so this would have been the Bonneville flood that came through here, followed up here, and then ultimately led up to Hell's Canyon, which is this right here. So the 40 million cubic feet per second discharge of the Bonneville flood uh, came through Hell's Canyon, whoops, which was this, and then when it flowed along the snake this way, and right here in the basin that is now occupied by Clarkston, um, Washington, Lewiston, Idaho, there would have been a huge uh, impoundment of water, and you had floods coming down from the northwest, the Missoula floods coming the Snake River this way, and you had the the Bonneville flood coming this way, and we've talked about this a number of times, right here at Tammany Bar, which is this feature right in here. And you can see the remnants of, of huge current ripples along this bar. And this is where the uh, Bonneville flood met the Missoula flood. And this gravel pit right here has um, some incredible outcrops where you can, damn it, why does it keep doing that? What am I doing here? I go back. Okay. Right here at this this gravel pit right here. Of course, every time we visited this gravel pit, it's changed. So, uh, but we have some photographs, very, very striking photographs where you can see the the very coarse bouldery deposits of the Bonneville flood that was going downstream when it came to this point. And then that's overlaid by the Missoula flood silts and fine sediment that was 
of course, fine because this is a back flood. The Missoula floods here were back flooding. So obviously the sediment entrained there in those uh, back floods is going to be a very low energy depositional environment. The Bonifield floods is going to be a high energy depositional environment. And you can see it very clearly in this in this uh in this outcrop right here. I'm trying to get it turned around. Let's see. There we go. I think I got it now. Let's see. There we go. Okay. I don't know what year this was taken, but yeah, you can see in here where they're exposing the sediments, which are composed of both Bonneville and um, Missoula. Can't see very clearly here on this, but maybe I'll pull up the picture before we're done. Actually, Brad, I think the area we visited, wasn't it Wasn't it this one with that first year? I think it was right here. No, it's right next to that road. Um, Over here. No, to the, to the left. It's hard to call it a road. It's just... Uh... You let's see that little green spot just south of your cursor there. Here, that, hill, that hillside to the right of yeah. that. Ah, yeah, that's about all that's left. Yeah, last time I was there, um, last year it was pretty much all gone. Yeah, you couldn't see that. It was an amazing outcrop, um, but they've they've quarried it away, so you can't really see it some more. But I'll <clears throat> maybe pull up a picture here if we take a break or something so people can see it because that's really an extraordinary somebody could do a whole phd thesis dissertation on that outcrop and what they're finding in that gravel pit and the interaction between these two tremendous floods um which according to the standard interpretations would would have no really relationship to each other that would just be two completely independent events that just so happened to have met at this point but all of this material in here is deposits so they're really only quarrying a small part of it and this is tammany creek and this is the, all of this in here is what's called tammany bar um and then you get notice here hell's gate state park because as you go well, let me turn this back around so we're looking north at the top and you just hit in true so this is, here we go, this is coming out of Hell's Canyon here. And so there's no roads through here. Um, so you have to do it by boat. That's why I was suggesting that this would be the culminating day of a Bonneville tour as we take this, we take the boat up through Hell's Canyon, which go is hell. the deepest canyon in North America. Deeper than Grand Canyon. And my question is, is how much of that deepening was produced by the Bonneville flood? In other words, how deep was it before 40 million cubic feet per second came roaring through the canyon? So anyways, <clears throat> so that's in regards to the great, great sand dunes. Um, and yes, there could have, I think that whole San Luis Valley there was probably a lake during the late Pleistocene, a temporary, very large lake, uh, probably the same set of lakes that would have included Lake Monoville. And of course, there's the whole story there of the massive Lake Monoville that ultimately, whose overflow, dis whose catastrophic discharge and overflow created the Bonneville flood. What kind of boat trip were you talking about? Like, a, you're not talking about canoeing that, are you? <laughs> How long would that take? Jet uh, <laughs> that would be beyond a, a day long trip. Yeah. Um, well, uh, good question. There are boat trips there. Yeah. Um, you, you I hire a boat amazing. and they yeah. take you down, down the river. And, uh, that's the only way you can really see the Canyon. Mm. Um, so you've got a, a dam or multiple dams down there. We, we drove all the way in like three hours the year we went there to get all the way down in and you can't get back out other than backtracking. Right, you get down to the dam, and that's about it. So, yeah, I know they got some jet boat tours down there. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's limited access for sure. Like you said, it's a you know, it's a mile down. So, tu tubing it is out of the question. Uh, I would think so. Some tubes and some beers. <laughs> okay. Unless you didn't value it's your never, life, <laughs> never because, out of the question. Um. Yeah, here's, let's see if we've got a, 
Hey guys, we wanted to show you what a fish Oops. would like. That's not what I wanted. Oh, I'm getting videos here. Sorry. Okay. We got more. Uh, I was just looking for a chats. picture here. Yeah, Images. we got plenty, we plenty go. more questions and comments. All right. Well, just as in reference to um, to uh, what's his name? Your brother Russ's um, comment here. Um, wow. So <laughs> I can do share screen and uh, where is here we go. All right, this is this is a jet boat tour through Hell's Canyon. Oh yeah, let's go. So yeah, I guess we could canoe it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's, that's too. Seems more like barrel. Like it would be a better option. <laughs> Maybe barrel. <laughs> we got plenty of barrels. <laughs> well, I tell you, this is I. This is something I really would like to do. And it, 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 we we have to do it, Brad. Otherwise, we haven't really completed the the Bonneville flood tour have we till we do this we bradley and i have followed the bonneville flood all the way from its origin in the area of lake bonneville which around salt lake <clears throat> up through red rock pass up through um its discharge into the snake river plain nearby american falls we followed the whole river all the way up pretty much to the mouth of hell's canyon where like you said the roads run out and we had to turn around and come back. And then from the north, we've come back south of Tammany Bar, you know, at the north end. But we haven't. So what I'm saying, Brad, is we haven't really completed the entire route. So we have right. to do the boat trip. Wow. Sign up for the jet boat. You guys are posers. <clears throat> All right. You haven't really I went. I went in there last year on my way to the Scablands uh, trying to find an overlook or and or a way down to the river but yeah i spent 45 minutes you know trekking some of these forestry mm. roads and found a found a nice uh spot to fly the drone from but yeah it wasn't <clears throat> anywhere near the river um uh, yeah it's uh, uh -huh. it's pretty dense wilderness out there for the most part yeah when you get when we do it we need a live stream we'll just live, yeah, we'll, do a live we podcast live stream, yeah. on that <clears throat> boat yeah. <laughs> set up the satellite <laughs> You're not going to get signal anywhere take, else. Take, take your Starlink with you. <laughs> no, but seriously, this is going to be a – we've gotten quite a bit of interest in a Bonneville flood tour. Yeah. So I think this could, is really going to happen. Oh, yeah. All right, let's push on. Okay. Noah, Noah Beard, five bucks, says, uh, Hey, Randall, had a great time at the War on Wisdom event in Nashville. Oh, great. Such an honor to meet you and Brad. Can't wait for the next event. Well, there'll Thank be you, more, Noah. Noah. Things are coming up. Things are happening. Yep. Thank you, Noah. Uh, Leland, $10. No comment. Thank you. No comment? No comment. Oh, oh, no comment. Yeah, okay. I'll, yeah no comment. This counts. Well, I think here's, here's $10 if you guys can ensure there's going to be no comment. <laughs> no, yeah, no $10 comment. for no comment, please. <laughs> I think Laura did forward us something. Somebody was asking if if we we're going to comment on the new asteroid or newly discovered asteroid. But yeah, I don't know anything about that. You guys heard? Oh, there's been several of them that. recently. None of them pose any danger to us. But <clears throat> of course, everyone yeah, that ongoing. we we discover is just another reminder that we live in a busy cosmic neighborhood, and sooner or later, you know, it's true. Um, Okay, Nicole Davidson, $5, says, Hi, gentlemen. Hope the Nashville visit was fruitful. Thank you for everything you have endured. Well, Thank it hasn't been that bad. <laughs> <laughs> There's she's, been time, so. She's talking to us, yeah, to yeah. Kyle and I. Everything oh, oh, we yeah. have endured <laughs> dealing <Okay>. with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's understandable. <laughs> <clears throat> I know that I. I mean, I. I know that typically after our tours together, I, you know, I do hear things, and I know you guys are traumatized <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, I think I think it's mutual, right? We all go home traumatized <laughs> from each other. <laughs> like yeah. we're all like, why are we doing this? <laughs> well, after the Pagosa Springs, I mean, I'm sure that we're all, you know. <laughs> Pretty much of the like mind, you know, after that that episode yeah. that we don't want to talk about. Right. 
<laughs> that we all experienced. <laughs> we were having such a good time and yes. <laughs> making lots of loud noise <laughs> and having a good old party time and wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I set them straight. I uh, blocked it out of my memory. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I have trying. too. <laughs> but every once in a while, I'll get this nightmarish figure. <laughs> I was, was going to say. Emerging. It's, folks, it's not that he, does, he doesn't He does want to tell the story. Just none of us remember it because it was traumatic. <clears throat> Kyle DeLille. Hey, buddy. What's up, bro? Hey, Kyle. Uh, Kyle, Kyle DeLille. 20... How are you doing, man? When are you going to be hanging out with us again? $20 Canadian. It says 10 bucks okay. each for the Snake Bros. For having matching shirts. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> oh, okay. You know so that's how not it's even be. planned. Yeah, it wasn't that's planned. That's for new T-shirts. <laughs> it wasn't planned. These were gifts from a from a buddy from of ours. Yeah, from Chris on the Egypt <laughs> tour, and we both somehow decided to wear the same <laughs> shirt tonight. <laughs> well, you know, I I kind of think it could start a a trend could be starting. Yeah, here. there's. <laughs> There's yeah, something becoming, shirts. very becoming about you guys. They're both wearing the same shirt. <laughs> Somehow it's, it's I I don't know the exact word, but I'd say it's it's comforting <laughs> to see you guys dressed like. <laughs> Shout out to Chris. Thanks, bro. Yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> Super dry, Brad. Brad Come on, doesn't man. like it. <laughs> I'll bring you one. I got one yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, we got plenty. We'll we'll bring Brad a super dry shirt. Oh, I want one. I just don't want to wear it the same day. You it's guys not going to be a polo shirt. shirt. Yeah. You're going to get a oh. polo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what else you got? Okay. Uh, we got a comment from Atlantis is found. Five uh -oh. bucks. Yeah, it says, I have Some... found Poseidon's temple. Would you be interested in the pictures? Poseidon with his trident and a large statue in the center with a sphere, etc. Well, sure. I mean, I'll look at anything. Yeah. Well, Scoop, not scuba photo. anything. Not any, okay, but, hold on. Uh, I have do have certain boundaries <laughs> that I that I don't want to transgress. But yeah, Poseidon with a trident, I can look at that from his submarine, his submersible. Uh huh. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know. Well, listen, I'm, you know, I'm open to whatever, but, you know, you got to make a pretty, to convince me that it's other than where I pretty much come to believe that if, if, and it's a big if, if there was an Atlantis, it's got to be pretty much where Plato described it, how he described it, what he described it. Because look, here's the question. How much can you, since Plato is 98% of our source, of information about Atlantis. How much can you deviate from Plato and still call it Atlantis? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, that's my thing. But, hey, if you found something, let's have a look, see what you got. All right. I do think there's a another comment from them further. That is too. a pretty audacious claim. Yeah, it is. Because even Strong I, claim, yeah. Who have... Who have worked my way through four or five different plant translations of Plato and have labored through the Greek, the original Greek, spent many, many hours studying maps, studying relevant geography, oceanography, geology, astronomy, etc. am not convinced that I know where it is. However, if I had to bet money, I'd bet money that it's pretty much where Plato says it is. And if you want to know where that is, Go ahead and pop out a little bit of coin and get whatever it is, nine or ten hour lectures that I put together to make my case for Atlantis. And I haven't seen anybody refute that yet. No one's refuted that yet. However, though, after reading the critics of Ancient Apocalypse, Graham's Netflix series, um, you know, I no longer believe in Atlantis because it was so thoroughly debunked by mainstream academia um <laughs> not yeah however it was used as a bludgeon though so that anybody who even utters the word um without complete condescension is then dismissed as a fruitcake fringe conspiracy theorist racist white supremacist so be careful guys if you utter the word atlantis 
in the wrong company, you might be branded. Okay. What else? So he's right. discovered Atlantis. The so. A word. Uh, Metanoia A-word. gives 320 yen. Says, greetings from Kyoto. Uh, greetings. There, there are secrets here, too. I'm sure. Cool. Yes. I would have no doubt that there would. Does he or he or she go into it? What you know, those No more details. Be? They are keeping their secrets. They're, They're keeping their secrets. Kyoto, Just yeah. to what? Entice us to come there and explore? And I would love, yes. Up? I, you know what? I had a whole trip to Japan planned out. I had the plane tickets bought, and then stuff happened, and it fell through, and I didn't get to go. But, yes, I did. I definitely was planning to go yeah. and explore. Walk the uh, uh-huh. Kyoto. Well, I have no road. doubt. I have no doubt that it le- that Japan has its secrets. Yeah. Um, because they're uh, – and I don't have them at my fingertips, but I have a number of interesting studies on – you know, prehistoric Japan. Yeah, there's lots of very interesting prehistoric stuff. And then all the megalithic, you know, mm-hmm. uh, foundations of the imperial areas. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's amazing. The canals, all of that mm-hmm. stuff is fantastic. Okay, Ryan. Ryan Kuhn, $50, says, Saved Super Chats from last week. Super Chats engagements build Super Chats engagement. And my last name isn't a troll. It is Gaelic, which is older than America. <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I do have some stuff from Ryan from last last live stream. Is it Andy? Uh, let me see. It might take me a minute to pull it up. Uh... Well, we didn't do any questions last time. No, we so didn't. It's did probably we? a backlog. Can't always save all of that stuff, though. Yeah, no, I don't. I Bit don't of a chore. It. Yeah. Well, she so got some new questions that we can that we can address. Well, I got to go back to where I was here. Hold on, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, he didn't ask a question there. But back to Jim. Jim Howard again, five pounds. Says, what sort of technology would you think the toroidal and plasmoid technologies would be like? For instance, stone walls with the melted-in-place look. Yeah, perhaps, yes. Uh, Because under certain circumstances, I think it can generate very high temperatures with plasmas. Of course, it requires high temperatures to generate a plasma in the first place. Um, I also think that there may be a way, and I don't want to talk about this yet until I'm more comfortable with the, with the science and the scientific explanation, but it does appear that the plasma energies could be used for moving heavy objects like large stones. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yes. To find that out. Yes. Yes. We'll we'll learn about that if that's possible for sure. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Many applications. Okay, J.J. Pearson, $2, says, you are a valuable premium specimen of a human. I'm a what? I'm a valuable prima donna of a human? What did he say? <laughs> He's talking about Brad, I'm pretty sure. Oh. <laughs> said you were two bucks. You are a valuable premium specimen of a human. Thank you. Premium. Ooh, I premium like premium. a specimen. Yeah. I think I'm going to get a T-shirt made with that on it. <laughs> Make sure it's a polo with white stripes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Got a Pre- shirt you... for you already. <clears throat> yes, premium specimens of humans. Is that what he said? Yes. Yes. Valuable. I, even. I like that. Valuable. Like, premium. premium. Yes. I'm a. Who 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 is he referring to here? It doesn't say. It just says you. <laughs> so oh, you. I maybe was guessing the, Brad. Maybe it's the collective you. <laughs> <laughs> A premium specimen. Is that what he said? That's right. Okay. Valuable premium specimen. Yeah. Not only, yeah, a valuable premium specimen. <laughs> With luscious like hair. <laughs> That's how we know who he's talking to. Okay, Jim Howard, five pounds again, says the Holy Grail is a Gobekli Tepe underwater. I've heard of a city 125 miles off the coast of Bombay. So have I. In fact, years ago, I watched a documentary on it. Um, 
it's I mean it is actually there. It's a city that's underwater, and I think part of that being underwater is because of land subsidence. Is it as much as ocean rise? Dwarka? Do you remember happen to remember the name of that city? Yeah, is it Dwarka? I'm trying to remember if that's that's right. it. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that. that's fascinating yep. stuff. Mm-hmm. Graham yeah. goes into that in his underworld book. There's lots of yeah. legends yeah. and myths. He talks to fishermen mm-hmm. who say that when the waves are exactly right, coming in in the right direction and at the right frequency, you can they can hear bells from the, the bells in the buildings underwater. Well, it, they say it sounds like bells are ringing under the water. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't remember that part. Of yeah, it. it's really cool. Okay, corn and cattle, twenty bucks. Says Mr. Carlson, have you seen the recent evidence? of a geomagnetic event that happened roughly 54,000 years ago. It was found in a bat cave in Portugal. What are your thoughts? Mm, I haven't seen the study yet, but I think you said a geomagnetic event, not a reversal. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if that 54,000, that could, um, let's see, that could fall very close to a climatic event. Um, let's see, my he's at 52. Yeah, it's about uh, four times. Yeah, so 52,000 is roughly two processional cycles ago. So this happened at 54,000. So that's what he said. Let's see, roughly 54k years ago, roughly 54k. Okay, let's see here. think we would classify that as a geomagnetic excursion nah. 54,000 years ago okay let's see we've got a looks like a field reversal 42,000 years ago which may have contributed to mass extinction this extinctions this was a article that appeared in Science News back in 2021. A flip-flop of Earth's magnetic poles between 42,000 and 41,000 years ago briefly, but dramatically shrank the magnetic field strength and may have triggered a cascade of environmental crises on Earth, a new study suggests. Uh, With the help of new precise carbon dating obtained from ancient tree fossils, the researchers Correlated shifts in climate patterns, large mammal extinctions, and even changes in human behavior just before and during the Lashamps or Lashamps excursion, a brief reversal of the magnetic poles that lasted less than a thousand years. It is the first study to directly link a magnetic pole reversal to large scale environmental changes. Ah, so the the full report, which I haven't read, but I'm going to definitely go after this now, was in the February 19th edition of Science. So All right. February, for the reference, February 19th, Science from 1921. So um, this, well, this, okay. Uh, this comment is specifically talking about recent evidence that was discovered in a pat, bat cave in Portugal. <clears throat> yeah, so that's what I'm going to here and what i'm keep coming up with is this forty-two thousand year event mm, okay um but let's see here if we've got anything else quickly we have more Atlantis so now questions. i think this forty-two thousand could be associated with the earlier um you know like some of um for example uh george howard's tusk yeah there was an earlier mass extinction that seems to be juxtaposed upon a later um, mass extinction episode. And I think that that's even showing up up there in what's his name's boneyard. Um, Oh yeah. um, What's his name? John Reeves. Yeah. Reeves. Reeves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that's in the 38, 39,000. Uh-huh. Which is interesting because 39,000. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's cycle and a half. Cycle and a half. Yeah. Uh, I'm not finding here something about the 54. Let's see. One surprisingly abrupt centennial reversal transition occurred 
in 144,000 years prior provides unprecedented evidence that reads, well, when was this? Um, we're talking about a stalagmite-based paleomagnetic record. Okay, so the Bat Cave, was it stalagmites then? Let's see, the Blake excursion. Sorry, what was be... that? What did you say, Randall? Well, that's a good reason for people to be more precise and specific about what their yeah, I mean, question maybe... is. If they're referring to a place or a coordinate or a paper or whatever, to just be specific if we want to yeah, maybe the, maybe got the find it wrong. quickly. Yeah, I'm not finding anything. Let's see. Here we go. Okay, here we go. Well, let's see. Okay, this is interesting. This is now this is in science, the the journal Science, Modern Human Incursion into Neanderthal territories 50,000 54,000 years ago at Mandarin, France. Um here we report hominin fossils from Grotte Mandarin in France that reveal the earliest known presence of modern humans in Europe between 56,800 and 51,700 years ago. This early modern human incursion in the Rhone Valley is associated with technologies unknown in any industry of that age outside Africa or the Levant. The Mandarin Mandarin documents the first alternating occupation of Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, with a modern human fossil and associated Neronian lithic industry found stratigraphically between layers containing Neanderthal remains associated with Mausterian industries. Okay, so there at this date, 54,000 years ago, it appears that there was that this particular area was occupied by Neanderthals. They were gone. Then it modern uh, Homo sapiens, and then they were gone, and Neanderthals came back. But um, <clears throat> I'm not finding anything specific on a magnetic field excursion 54,000 years ago. Okay. Well, let's. But here we can move on. We got plenty more questions. Well, okay, one more thing here okay. from physicsworld.com. Uh, what do we got here? Um, stalagmites boost precision of carbon dating over 54,000 years. Well, okay, so this is just simply saying we know that radiocarbon dating has pretty much lost its efficacy at around 50,000 years. But what they're saying now is by using uh, stalagmites, in caves, they're able to now push the radiocarbon dating back to 54,000 years. Ah. Um, but it's not specifically saying anything um, about um, anything that happened to the Earth's magnetic field at 50,000, 54. Although they're going on, they do go on to talk about the last geomagnetic excursion, which was the brief reversal of the Earth's magnetic field. Here they're saying around 43,000 years ago, the previous work said 42, but it's, I'm sure it's within the, the range of, of error that they've established for it. But no, I'm not seeing anything about... Okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> well, now this... Oh, We I, got like 15 this, minutes and a bunch of super chats. I don't know if you want to move on. There's still a lot more. Yeah, there's a lot okay. more. Okay. But just, this is something that I predicted years and years ago, which pushes the whole, uh, the whole timing of when people first use bow and arrows and here it says homo sapiens in europe used bow and arrow fifty four thousand years ago mm. that's interesting yeah. okay let's go let's go on but i just had to mention that fifty four thousand years <laughs> that that's is, uh, that's cool that's because previous to this bow and arrow was considered to be a uh a neolithic invention yeah, yeah. recent yep Okay, uh, Baby Blue Sky, again, five pounds, says, are there any ways to accurately identify the location of Atlantis? Why aren't there more efforts to locate this place that would change us so much? Well, you better go and, and watch the entire there Atlantis 10-hour lecture that I put out there, um, and that will answer all your questions. I will just say this, though. Um, going by Plato's account, um, Atlantis is under the ocean which means it's not that accessible. Um, yeah. But I think if you if you go and you, you watch that, you know, work your way through that entire 10 hours, you should have as solid of an understanding 
of the whole Atlantis situation, the whole Atlantis story as you're going to get anywhere. And again, because I think the thing that I do in there is I, I go so deeply into Plato's actually actual account and then go through correlations from geology, geography, astronomy, oceanography, and so on to establish whether or not Plato's account is viable. And I think the, the, the conclusion is that it is viable. And so if he's correct, then it's under the ocean as much as one to two miles, and which means that it's not accessible for study, and that's why. Now, if we could get some submersibles down in the area where it likely is, who knows what we'll discover. Yeah, oh, yeah people... going back to the podcast, uh, <clears throat> started really early, like number three, uh, yeah. when we were pretty primitive in our efforts there, but... Uh three through 10. So yeah, there's probably 12, 14 hours in the podcast itself. And yeah. then the, uh, uh, the video on demand that's available, Randall did part one and part two of, uh, Atlantis that, uh, kind of summarized that, but also went a little deeper also, uh, I think is seven hours. So the forthcoming part three would make it 10 hours. So I think you're committed mm. now to doing part three since oh. you said it's 10 hours committed. So there's, Plenty of material to dive into, is oh, what yeah. I'm saying. Plenty of material. And uh, it's so, I mean, it. I really try to substantiate everything with, with real studies, science, evidence. And I also take a short look at some of the other theories and why I don't think those pass muster, which is primarily because they virtually all have to change the details of Plato's narrative. And what I set out to do with this Atlantis series was to try to not change any of the details that Plato gives, to take it at face value that he's got an authentic tradition and it's correct and it's more or less correct in its details. So that was my, my pro approach. Okay. Um, so this is another one from Atlantis is found five five dollars. So if you want to see proof, I have plenty. This is the person who says they found Atlantis. My profile picture is Poseidon with his trident in the ocean. It's real, and so am I. Disclosure is in progress. Well, all right. Mm -hmm. well, and then I'll later they later they do ask where do I send the pictures if you you said you want to see them. Oh, um, yeah. I think I think. This person sent an email or two, um, but yeah, they didn't send a website or a photo or, you know, mm. it's just, if you want to see it kind of thing, but we, Randall gets lots of that stuff and That's right. there's just no way to respond to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Well, can, okay. Bob Baker <clears throat> gives $10 and 80 cents. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and then another person, let's see, P Atlantis, another Atlantis. Ten dollars. Just sending you a little support. Keep doing what you're doing. From who? From P. Atlantis. <laughs> oh, but do more. Thank you, P. <laughs> uh, uh, Ryan, ten dollars <clears throat> says concrete is a lost art. How about those Greeks? <laughs> so this is, uh, I guess, in reference to when we were talking about geopolymers. Mm -hmm, probably so. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking the Romans. Is that's what he, he's probably maybe. The Romans were the ones that are renowned for their concrete. Yeah. Uh, Anzu, Anzu Love, $5, says, if the book catalog is organized in shelves, I think she's talking about your library back there, mm -hmm. can you guys just take a picture and let us make the catalog? Just an idea. Keep up the awesome live streams. Mm. Yeah, that's a possibility. Taking a picture. Just make sure none of your secret books are in there when you take the picture, Randall. Well, this is true. Yeah. Yes. You have to take out all the. Just yeah, all of the classified <laughs> all of your, stuff. Your grimoires. I thought about and... that when I was in there last time, but I didn't do it. <laughs> Had to thought. Okay, Matt, fifty dollars says off topic, but do you guys think the pyramids could be an ancient Chernobyl that had to be covered up? You guys are great, and if you don't hear it enough, you definitely should. Thank you, hey, Matt. That's cool. An ancient Chernobyl. Yeah. There's a bu there was a bunch of them. Yeah. That had to be covered a, up. Like a power plant, like a you know, a, some kind of power generation that 
I think he's talking about like how Chernobyl had Went to be covered. Wrong. Yeah, they put the big the yeah. sarcophagus on it. Yeah. Yeah. The Great Pyramid. The pyramids. The pyramids covered with what? Like, like I don't know. I'm guessing, but there were power plants there and then they covered them with in stones. giant triangles <laughs> because they were radioactive. That's basically the idea. Oh, sealed oh. sealed them in. Yeah. The pyramids were then a kind of a containment yeah. effort. I think that's what he's saying. Okay. If we put it there, because I'm I began thinking, well, Gobekli Tepe covered up. Right. And I'm picturing, so what, somebody come, came in and covered up the pyramids with with dirt? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they've had to remove it? No, okay, if you're, if you're talking about, you know, in reference to... Or covered up I haven't like seen the... anything to suggest that. Yeah, or it was um, it, does it mean covered up like the, the, the government at the time was like, nothing to see here, move along, you know... Oh, what I, kind of cover well, up I was are we taking it about? literally. That, I do, yeah, you know, I don't know. That it was that was the pyramids were an effort. To, so somewhere within the pyramid, there's some kind of a <clears throat> there's a a, a, a power, nuclear power plant I, or something. I, Is this is what? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. It sounds pretty speculative, but you never know, right? I I'll, know. I'll say this: I haven't seen anything that would have suggested to me that that was the case. Mm. But that. You know, hey, look, we still don't really know what the pyramids ultimately, what their function was. Right. Uh, just to be fair, guys, like we're probably <coughs> going to be wrapping it up pretty soon. I know there's a mm. whole lot mm. of super chats still to get to. So just yeah. so you know, mm. if you send a message and want a question answered at this point, <clears throat> likelihood is we won't get to it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, I tell you what that we will try to do, though, is if we can pull out the, the really interesting questions, kind of carry them over, perhaps. We can ne if, we never get to all the questions in any live stream. <laughs> It'll just stack up. <clears throat> but, you know, it's up to you, boss. Very thorough ones. Specific well, ones. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a range of questions. Um, yeah. You know, and we, when we just open the floor, I mean, yeah, we get into a lot of different stuff. So, yeah. What I'm kind of getting at, I guess, is, you know, over a period of several shows, we get, um, you know, similar questions regarding similar things. And that'd be worth perhaps trying to dive into a little bit. Like the geopolymer question has come up, what, twice tonight? Yep. Atlantis you know, so has come up So if that comes up times. two or three times again. Yep. But... Yeah, well, let's if we got a little time, let's let's try to knock out a few more. Okay, that Star Wars Star Wars girl gives twenty dollars. Says, "Hey guys, great show. Been watching for a while, but first time catching it live. My family is from the Azores. I would love to have you on my show sometime to talk about Atlantis. Keep up the great work." Well, I think yeah, let's do it. Nice. Yeah. If you've got a show and you're from the Azores, let's let's do it. There you Contact go. us and we'll. Uh, What's the name of the show? We'll set something up. Because I'll, I'll be honest with you, there are very few things that I love talking about more than Atlantis. <laughs> send a link so, to yeah, the show. Send a link and uh, we'll set it up and we'll, we'll have a, a conversation. And, she <clears> says yay. And I've she just learned <laughs> that there are now direct flights from Chicago to the Azores. Uh -huh. oh, yeah. So, yeah, so when we first started mm -hmm. talking about tours and excursions to the Azores that didn't exist so maybe somebody heard us talking and said hey we got to establish direct flights to make it easier for these guys to get here who is this this is what who is this from that Atlantis? Star Wars girl that Star Wars girl. Star Wars Anna. girl yeah. okay well Star Wars girl yeah hit us up she says she where sent should... you an email a month ago Randall oh What's how dare you? you yeah you're a terrible person Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder she probably sent it to my Gmail, which is so crammed with spam. I, I got to figure out what to do. I need help. Start just, a new just put the name of the show in the chat. There we go. Put the name of the show in the chat, and we will check it out, and then we'll figure out how to arrange this thing, probably after we do our Cumberland tour. I am I have zero time for the next three weeks, but after that I'll have a few weeks uh, interval in there. And um, let's do it. 
Maybe that is the name of her show. Could be that. Yeah, that's the name of the show. Probably that is. Star Wars girl. Oh, Star Wars girl. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. A couple more comments here. Oz. Okay. Oz Brumby, ten dollars says, "Is the higher level of CO two in the atmosphere the reason life was so prolific in the past, both dinosaurs and mega mammals?" <clears throat> CO2 I think plus that's... O plus H2O, so carbon dioxide plus oxygen plus water combination. I think that's very plausible and possible. Yes, I do. Um, because we know that um, if <clears throat> if you're watching our recorded shows, you know, we're getting into that. We're getting into the role of carbon dioxide in uh, ramping up the uh, viability and health of the biosphere, which means more biomass, which, you know, more plants at the bottom of the food chain means it, it reverberates all the way up to the top. And so I think that that's very possible um, that that's the case. And we're going to kind of be getting into that. We, we won't get into that right now because that's something we will be getting into in more depth and are actually getting into right now um, on our recorded podcast. Yep, I'm way behind on the editing, but uh, 94 is about to come out in the next couple of days, and uh, it does directly get into more of the role of CO2 and uh, plant plant growth. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Emily, Emily Stevenson gives $20, says El Centro, or the center, California, is 600 feet below sea level. Where would it be located in Pangea? What does the world look like at 600 feet below sea level compared to 350 feet? Oh, my God. Jeez. That's, I don't know, it's a great question. And um, 600 feet, you know, I wonder if that's, so read it again. It, so it's it's 600 feet below sea level. Yeah. Where would it and be located it... in Pangea? What does the world look like at 600 feet below sea level compared to 350 feet? So it's this, what, what's the place she's referring to? El Centro, the center, El California. El Centro. Yeah. Not familiar with that, but it's 600 feet below sea level. Now, is the assumption here that it was above sea level at one point? I don't know. Good question. Um, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I thought Death Valley was the lowest yeah. place on the continent or, or too. farther even. Well, wait, wait, I don't, 230 is it, feet. Is it, under the, is it under the Pacific Ocean or it's on land? I'm not at all familiar with El Centro. I don't know. Yeah. Nope. If you want to put together a little bit more information on it and get with us on our next live stream, maybe we can talk about it. But I don't think any of us know anything about that. Um, and what the – gosh, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I, I've i never really thought about that much only because I haven't um, seen any – any references or suggestions of uh, sea level 600 feet lower yeah. than at present. Now, there can be 600 feet differential between modern sea levels and ancient sea shorelines, for example, but it's not fully eustatic changes in sea level because it's also isostatic changes in land level. For example, let me put this, say this relatively quickly. When you look at the great mass of ice over North America, like you can go out to the West Coast near British Columbia, the weight of that ice pushing down at the under the ice itself caused the ice, I mean, the land just outside the, the ice sheet to rise, right? So, and it, and it could have risen, it's called the glacial four bulge, and it's, it could have risen by hundreds of feet. Then when the, and so you got a picture, you've got this lowered sea level, say 400 feet down now the ra the land rises seven you know three four hundred five hundred feet right so now there's a difference between the area the, the land which has risen and the sea level which has gone down now the ice melts isostatic compensation causes the central basin to rise but the glacial four bulge collapses so it goes down while sea level comes up and so that can create the impression of a 600 foot differential El Centro, I don't know what that is. I'm not familiar with that. Um, I don't even know if you're, I, I presume it's somewhere, where in California? That's what, that's what she said. Okay, well, uh, do a little more digging into, what's her name? Who, who is Emily. it? Emily. 
Steven said. Emily, yeah. look into it a little more. Um, yeah, and get back to us with some more information. Because I none of us have heard of it. So we can't really have many opinions on it. But it sounds interesting. Next question. Okay. Uh, Dave Myers gives two bucks. Thanks, buddy. Uh, Big Z, $10. Good evening, fellas. Have you looked into any evidence of 19th century mud floods? Yes. Specifically tar- pertaining to, some, to Tartarians in America. Yes. And and I'm not going to say that I'm, you know, fully educated about mud floods, but certainly mud floods are um, going to be the consequence of, of heavy and torrential rains. And that's something I have looked into is, is pluvial events. So kind of as a secondary consequence of looking at pluvial events, you look at mass wasting events such as landslides and things which could include mud floods um, that are a consequence of really intense torrential rains. Um, so, yeah, but but there's a lot of literature out there on mud floods that I haven't accessed yet, to be honest. But if you have some more information, is that who's this? This asking this big Z, big Z. If you've yeah. got more information, he's um, specifically talking about nineteenth century stuff. Tartarians. Yeah, nineteenth. Yeah, not specifically nineteenth century. No. Okay. Maybe he's got some data on specific yeah, events. If you do, um, check back in with us in in a couple of weeks when we're doing another live, and um, if you can post some references or something, or some sources that we can look at then we could address specifically what you're commenting on based upon what you've seen or read. All right. We got to wrap it up here. So let's do one more. Rex, $20, says, Cosmographia Boneyard Trip, yanking mammoth tusks from the mucky muck with George Howard. Let's go. <laughs> well, let's go. <laughs> I would love to just invite everybody along. I We're not in, we're not in control of that, though. Um, yeah not up to us because we will be guests um and so who we who we can bring along we'll see but you know that doesn't mean that down the down the road a little bit um there may be more public accessibility to this um we've had a lot of volunteers yeah so uh yeah so that's it we can't ask any more questions yeah I mean, we got a bunch more comments good. With, uh, with donations. Horn Pub, tw- uh, $2. Fringy, 10 bucks. Mary Jenkins, 25 Atlantis is found again, $5. Asking how do I send my pictures, which we answered that. And then I think Kyle has some. Let's see. Yeah, more. Um, uh, could he post those on HowTube somewhere? What, the photographs? Yeah, Build a website. It's the best pictures. way to get them out there. I'm just being a jerk. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Um, info at randallcarlson.com there, there you go. go there we go info at randallcarlson.com Captain Cave Dad five bucks thank you Rogue uh, Doge one ten dollars Jason Martin four thirty two four dollars and thirty two cents thank you uh, Eponus Eponus Tribe ten dollars Common Sense ten dollars Crypto Jedi twenty bucks Matthew Matthew K, uh $20. Ryan Coon, 2 bucks. Commander Corvus Corax Nevermore, $5. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> name. <laughs> That's a great name. It's good to hear from you, Commander. We've <laughs> been wondering how things are going with you. <laughs> uh Conrick Robertson, 5 bucks. West uh, Britannicus, $5. Fancy Pants, 5 bucks. <laughs> Enki, $20. Nick Levecchia, $5. Peter Shell, $108. Thank, Thank you, Peter. Ah, uh, Peter, yeah. Peter's always good. Never fails. Uh, is Peter going to be joining us in the Scablands or anywhere? Are we going to be seeing him again? He's going Upper Cumberland with us. Oh, he's okay, Scablands that's right. a couple times, but yeah, he'll, he'll be with he'll, us in Kentucky. Well, yeah, he's he's got to complete the trifecta. <laughs> that's right. Ryan Coon, $50. Nick Levecchia again five dollars. Uh, Bob Baker ten eighty. Um, Great number, Brian. Mick Miser five dollars. 
Shane Swinson, a dollar. Benjamin F uh, Fairhall, twenty dollars. Shane Swinson again, ten dollars. Ryan awesome. Coon Thank you, everybody. again, five dollars. And uh, I have to mention, <clears throat> he. I will say this. He he mentioned that uh, an idea would be to Ryan. Yeah, Ryan, Ryan mentioned it. an idea would be to basically once a month go through the super chats that are all over twenty bucks. So maybe a version of that idea yeah, could be yeah. crypto Chris yeah. two hundred dollars. Wow. wow, thank you, buddy. Says so gonna Chris. see you in two hundred. Well, we got a. Does he have a question? We got it. Just says good show as always. See you in June at the Cosmic Summit. Yeah. Oh, sure. great. Yeah, we'll be make sure there. you introduce yep. yourself. Who is this from? I want to remember Crypto the name. Chris. Crypto Who? Chris. Yeah. We'll be hanging out. Yeah. Please. Okay. Yeah, we'll be hanging out. Appreciate you, man. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yep. That's oh great. really well i had a really good time and i'm sorry that we have to end it but we'll do it again that's right that's right yeah and and that star wars girl that is the name of her show right. i looked it up it's on youtube we, that yeah. star wars girl yeah okay from that the, from star the wars azores girl. yeah she's the one from the azores that wants to talk atlantis so you can nice you can do that all right good night everybody all good right night. yep good job all right good night Adios. good show y'all Oh wait, is my job to stop this? Yeah, it's your job. What do I do? Click. At the top, there's oh, wait, a I, big red button. Oh, the giant red button. That's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so 